we are inching closer to being able to talk primarily about the doings and the theory of restoration um, this semester, but we have a, a few more things we need to get to. One of those things is we need to talk about the abiotic environment that constitutes um, wetlands in the abiotic context. Then after this, we can talk about the, the ecological or the biotic aspects of wetlands, and then we'll be ready to go. I find that this lecture is oftentimes difficult for a lot of folks because we're going to talk about some things here that, uh, you know, some chemistry issues, some this and that. So it's all good. So it's all good, right? So you guys can review this later. You can review the lecture later. But, um, but I understand this isn't everyone's forte, and it's all good. So ask me questions about stuff if we, as we go through if things aren't, aren't confusing. But this is, this is a bit more of a me talking to you lecture as opposed to discussion lecture. So I, I apologize for that, but uh, it's kind of the nature of the beast. Okay? So let's talk about the abiotic aspect of wetlands in general. Today I'm going to first run you guys through uh, the first of our Meet the Marshes. So very quick, just shots, some quick images of some of our local wetlands to give you guys a sense for uh, what they're like. And then we'll, from there, transition into talking about basic wetland hydrology and, and some of the key concepts there. Then we'll switch to talking about soils and some of the key concepts about soils that you guys should be familiar with. And then we'll finish off talking um, specifically about tidal salt marshes and how maybe some of these things come together to give us uh, a sense of these ecosystems. So first, let's talk about some of our marshes. These are all coastal salt marshes that I'm going to show you right now. We'll start up north in southern Santa Barbara County. This is Carpinteria Salt Marsh. This is a remnant um, salt marsh. As with essentially all of the examples I'm going to show you here, the remnant of what was once a much larger system. We'll have a more detailed discussion about the historic changes of these systems in the future, but that's Carpinteria Salt Marsh. So this is the uh, you know, angular view, side view. If we look straight down, it looks like this. So this is some mapping that we've uh, done, uh, um, did this a couple years ago, to essentially look at the relative contribution of the different elements of the landscape to these particular systems. In this case, we're looking straight down on Carpinteria, and you see the classic aspect of these coastal salt marshes, which is there's a freshwater source, there is a uh, marine source. In this case, obviously the marine source is the ocean right here, and we're talking about um, these tidal creeks. So under high tide, uh, the salt water can push in, goes through all these really beautiful networked, um, fine scale, fine branching, multiple order streams, tidal, tidal streams or tidal uh, channels. In this case, the fresh water is coming from urban runoff and, and, uh, and the local watershed and is entering in here and or here. Um, this is actually a restoration, which we might talk about uh, in the future, but for right now, I'm, I'm leaving that, that off. So what you see is, in this case, this is, I can tell this is an old marsh. How can I tell this is an old marsh? One, because there's so much fine branching to this. And, um, and it's very old, and it's a relatively stable marsh, not a huge amount of disturbance because it's primarily vegetated. There's not a lot of open space, open salt pans, open patches, and again, not so much today, but later on we'll learn about that's an important dynamic in these systems. So that's Carpinteria salt marsh. Note, it's primarily vegetated. Let's switch, let's come down the coast now to closer to campus, which is uh, Magoo Lagoon. This used to be called um, Magoo Lagoon Naval Air Weapons Station. Now it's called um, uh, Naval Base Ventura County, and it's unified with a couple other sections, uh, a couple, couple of units, <clears throat> but we still refer to it as Magoo Lagoon because we primarily care about the salt marsh aspect of it. So um, again, to orient you, here's PCH, here's Las Posas that goes to campus, um, and then this, this way is towards Malibu and Los Angeles. So here are the main elements of the salt marsh that uh, we've worked in in the past. And if we zoom in, I'm just zooming in on this central area that we call the central basin. If we zoom in on the central basin, again, what we see is primarily vegetation is the most common landscape element. Although here there are much more, um, uh, a much greater array of salt pans of bare open space. Um, 
uh, a good amount of water. What do you guys notice about the tidal creeks here? Do they look the same as the last one? Right, so there, there still definitely are a lot of tidal creeks here, but they're much more like main channels, right? Much less finely branched. There is some fine branching. If we look in here, you know, we can see that. We can see this, but it's not, it's not the same degree of innervation, and, and uh, you can think of it um, as less blood vessels, if you will, or less, le less of a venation system or arterial system in the, the uh, marsh. And uh, yeah, and so this is a, a restoration that we'll hear about later. This is one of the first, this is the first e ecological restoration I ever did, actually, many years ago. Um, so cool. So we, so we got that uh, going on. And then here's another section of the same area. So here is Central Basin is over here to the right. Now we're looking at these other areas. And now this is becoming more characteristic of a lot of the wetlands that we have left in um, in California and increasingly around the world, which is not a pretty contiguous, uh, you know, quote unquote, natural systems, but rather fragmented, piecemealed, chunked out uh, systems, bifurcated by infrastructure, bifurcated by human development. So in this case, if we look at if we look at uh, 12th Street North site, there's definitely vegetation, but there's also a lot of water. Right? So this notion of um, what is a wetland is becoming interesting because we have wetland elements here, but it's, it's a highly disturbed system right there. Let's go further down the coast. This is Malibu Lagoon. And uh, this is, let's see, this picture I'm showing you here is before our most recent restoration. So this is the old design. Um, and this uh, also is using the old design. We haven't mapped it. We've, we've done a new restoration, which you guys will hear about. A lot of this has been changed around. But um, leaving that aside for a second, what we see is uh, here is the salt marsh. And it, it has a lot of vegetation, but also a lot of open water, right? Almost no tidal creeks. Technically, these are tidal creeks, but, but they don't look anything like the tidal creeks that we just were looking at. Um, they're more like formal channels in a harbor or or something of that nature. And again, we'll talk about the whole history of this and why they look that way. Uh, but uh, this system is dominated by open water, dominated by water. And then just lastly, uh, we'll talk about it, but Biona wetland, which is yet again, another highly fragmented wetland. So these are all examples of the kinds of wetlands we'll be talking about more um, once we get a better handle on the type of system. So that was Carpinteria, Magoo Lagoon, Malibu Lagoon and Biona Wetland. All right, let's talk a little bit about the hydrology, basic wetland hydrology. A couple concepts I want to expose you guys to, and those are listed here. Firstly, hydro period. Next, tidal prism. Next, water budget. Residency time, and then a, a just general notion of a hydrological model. These concepts are interrelated and they, they influence one another, but let's take them one at a time. Let's talk about hydrology uh, uh, to begin with, um, but specifically the hydro period. This is referring to a temporal pattern of the amount of water in our wetland. The flood duration here, which is, which is part of the hydro period, is a measure of how long that a, a, a given um, you know, square meter of, of our wetland is subtidal, is, has, stand, has water over the surface of the soil. And then frequency is how many times a, a flooding event, an inundation event happens um, and this could be expressed over different scales. It could be expressed over the week, over the month, over the year. Um, it'll depend a little bit if we're talking about a seasonal wetland that's flooding or a tidal salt marsh that's getting daily, uh, daily tides. So um, hydro period is made up of flood duration and flood frequency. So this is what we mean by that. So here on the, on the graphs that I've put up for you, these represent the high, the, the, these are um, measures through time of the amount of water. And we see some characteristic things here. So for example, some of our, some types of wetlands like bottomland, hardwood forests, 
uh, have a certain level of water and then we hit the rainy season and everything goes wet and everything stays wet for an extended period of time and then at some point we leave that wet period and we go to the dry period and we drop back down right and there might be smaller scale fluctuation but there's really this strong seasonal component right uh, in other cases when we're say right next to the side of a stream let's say an area that that maybe gets a lot of uh, rainfall or input we might see that that uh, height of water follow more regular releases maybe this is from a dam maybe this is from um, some other uh, aspect and then we have something like say a tidal salt marsh that never ever has massive swings it never goes you know 14 well there are places that might do this but for the most part these systems don't do you know 14 feet high 14 feet down it's a much more up down up down a much smaller range of water um, over it and one way you can one simple way you can measure hydro period is just by literally jamming a, jamming in a ruler into the ground of the mud so this is one of my restorations up in northern california where we're trying to restore a, um, a seasonal pond and it was literally a, a rod and then a ruler. And this is what that looked like when it dries out. So you could literally just go out once a day or once an hour or whatever and, and note it. Or you could put a more fancy electronic sensor that could measure if it's wet and how much water is above it. But that's the basic idea. Hydro period. That's the first concept. Next concept, tidal prism. Now this specifically, this only relates to our wetlands uh, at the coast, estuaries, or perhaps some wetlands adjacent to lakes. So this is something where we really have a, a strong up, daily up-down. The tidal prism is an estimate of the amount of water that's going to leave, or for that matter, enter, I suppose, a, a wetland area over the course of a tidal cycle. So how much is getting in, how much is getting out? The net, the net movement of water. <clears throat> in reality, it's, systems are much more complex than this simplified uh, version, but this is really important because even if we're not 100% if we're not 100 accurate, the notion is very, very key for especially the, the initial designs of the restoration. How much water, how much scour do we think we might be seeing at the mouth of this area? how much water might be coming in to supply moisture for the plants and this and that. So tidal prism is, is a really key measurement. And it's simply uh, a measure of the discharge during a cycle. Uh, and that comes from the total volume that's changed over a given tidal cycle and how long it takes that water to run in or out. Water budget is the adding up of all the, just like you have a budget for your bills, this is a budget for water. So how much water is coming into the system, how much water is leaving the system. So that's gonna be all the possible sources. So in the, in the case of inputs, it could be the ocean tides, it could be the river running, it could be the next door neighbor irrigating his crops or his lawn. It could be subsurface groundwater. It could be stuff we don't even see that's burbling up um, from down below. Similarly, oh, sorry. And then another really key one, especially in Southern California, is just the sun beating down on this and evaporation. So water can leave through just about all the paths that it comes in by. Oftentimes, though, we seem to only focus on the input and we don't so much focus on the, on the output. But a water budget is all the inputs plus all the outputs. And by going through that, that'll again, like the tidal prism, that'll sort of help you frame the big picture. What are we talking about? One of the first questions we talk about uh, when, we des when we work on the design of a wetland is, hey, what are the water sources, right? And what are the water sources now? And while it's impossible to completely know the future, what do we think the water sources will be like, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now? water budget. <clears throat> a key aspect of this stuff that relates to this is this notion of residency time. So it has to do with tidal prism, it has to do with your budget, but the idea is how rapidly 
does water, say, like, say an imaginary water molecule, or if you will, a pollutant that's released into this wetland, how long will it hang out in that wetland? What's the residence time? This particular picture is a picture from one of our monitoring sites out at Magoo Lagoon. And this is in a constrained area, a constricted area of the marsh. This is not near the freshwater input, not near the saltwater uh, connection. This is sort of a backwater channel. And uh, this picture was taken in June. So this is summertime, it's starting to get warm. We have a bunch, we have an algal bloom happening here. And indeed, all of the open water, all the standing water here in this segment of the salt marsh, if you look in this picture, appears green, or at least most of it is green. So this algae, love it, right? Oh man, ooh, growing, 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 warm water, uh, and just grow, 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 grow like crazy. High sunlight, grow, 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 grow. Um, this, uh, you know, a particle of water, or a particle of uh, an algal individual, in this part of the marsh has a very long residency time, much longer than, say, near the mouth, uh, uh, than a molecule of water at the mouth of the estuary. So again, maybe that's a good thing. If we're talking about the baby, you know, the fish eggs that we want to keep inside our wetland, residency time is a good thing. If we're talking about some uh, less desirable water conditions, anoxic conditions or a pollutant or something like that, high residency time is a bad thing. So residency time in and of itself is neither good nor bad, but it implies, it tells us a lot about the functioning of the system. Cool. So you can yeah. have a residency time for any aspect. Well, yeah, you could you could have a res you could have a, a residency time for any aspect. Although typically we talk about it in terms of water. Yeah, but but in theory you could have it in the soil. But that uh, that's usually not something we can easily manipulate with our restoration. Whereas water is, we could change the width of the channel to affect the residency time. We could constrict the channel to influence the residency time, etc. And, and just as a quick note, since this picture shows it so well, so this was a culvert. This was a, a tube. And then right to the left here where I'm taking the picture is a road. And so this, they, you know, boom, throw a road here. Well, that's bad because now what's the water going to do? So th these are essentially straws underneath the, the, underneath the roads that were added so that there's connectivity of water so that the water, say, to the, so the mouth, the ocean is out here to the right. So by doing this, this helps get ocean water into the left and takes water here from the left out. So that, that helps the residency time. But it just illustrates the, some of the many challenges. This culvert is rotten. I don't think this is the one. Wait, is this the one? No, it's a different one. I was standing on right around this time and it just rotted away and I fell into the water and it cut up my leg and I had to go get a tetanus shot. That's why I remember it. But, um, but uh, uh, so you see that that old piece of metal is rusted in this saltwater environment, right? Many of these culverts at Magoo are sedimented in. So, so they've, you know, they used to be a big giant circle. Now they're more like a little teeny tiny miniature D on its, on, on its side because they're so constrained with flow. So, so um, uh, residency time is a, is a major thing in, in wetlands like uh, Magoo Lagoon. Uh, we can see lots of hydrological models. We can have a conceptual hydrological model. You've seen this one already. This is our model of potential Spartina, invasive Spartina invading one of our uh, potential rest restorations up in San Francisco. So you can have a conceptual model or you can actually have a numerical model. So I'll, I'm going to show you guys a few numerical models here. So this particular one is from a bay in China. And, um, and so what we're looking at here, the ocean is down here in the front. So th this is a Bathymetry. So here, here's the bay we're talking about. Okay. So we have wetlands. Well, we used to before we threw a million factories in this place. Now this place is horribly polluted and there's all kinds of challenges going on with this particular bay. But in any event, so here's the, here's the area. Here is the, op is the ocean connection and here are freshwater inputs. So that's all we've modeled here. So we're looking at the bathymetry, the bottom of the uh, bay and or estuary. So uh, the folks that created this um, were modeling a couple different things and they had a bunch of questions that aren't really so important for us. Rather, the red dots represent points on the surface. The blue dots indicate points that are near the bottom or in the midwater of 
the area. So I'm, we're just going to watch this model go through a cycle real quick. So that, 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 that's tidal cycles we're watching, right? Tidal cycles in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. So um, there, some particles, right, got out with, over the course of a few tidal cycles, right? Let's watch it again. So some, some part, so tidal cycle, full cycle, another cycle, another cycle, another cycle, right? You get, so so, this, so um, with a constrained system like this, like we have this you know, narrow mouth, so there's a large volume. We, we clearly, this whole volume isn't going to empty every day. Um, so that's going to imply some stuff in terms of residency time. This model right here was only looking at tides. If we just made a physical bowl that matched the bowl, that's the bay, and then just had, had you know, sort of a bellows pushing or, or pulling water in or out. Let's see what happens when we add the wind. So now we're adding on the traditional wind that flows in this part of China. And let's see what happens now. So now we got some of the subsurface stuff. Some of the, some of the, uh, the blue balls also got out of the mouth of the bay, but, a lot, but none of the surface guys did, right? So, um, so this residency time is not just a function of the shape or the water inputs. It can get complex. It can get complex with things like culverts. It can get complex with things like uh, wind and other environmental conditions. Okay, so that, that's a hydrological model. That, we call that a particle model. Here's another type of model. So let's watch this one. Now this is, this is the same thing, but just um, uh, two different views. So this is, now we've, we've come over to, to North America. Now we're in Canada. We're looking straight down on this bottom panel. So over here to the left, this is going to be the freshwater source. Over here, this is going to be the, towards the, the mouth of the ocean, right? Or the, or the ocean. So density here is going to be more oceanic. It's not full marine, but, it's, but it's, it's more marine with a dark blue. The hotter colors are fresher water. This is looking straight down on the surface of the water. This panel here is a cross section of a segment of the estuary. So again, this part is over here. This part is over here. Now have a look, right? To start with, this guy is light blue. This is all light blue. This is dark blue, right? Because this is this bottom panel is only showing the surface most layer, the very, very, very top edge of this. Okay, so let's see again what's going to happen over the course of a couple uh, tidal cycles. Right. So we have at some point we have the the seawater pushing in, and then the, the the tides going out, and the river starts to dominate the flow. So um, so that's a that would be a more traditional. A straightforward uh, riverine hydrological model. Uh, here is one from the Bay of Fundy, which is a, a very uh, famous um, uh, estuary for really extreme extremes. Um, and so this is going to be through the tidal cycle. So again, two panels here. The top panel is going to show you what the tide is doing in the model. And then this is movement of, uh, of the water. So, so the longer the arrow, the more, the more velocity is being experienced by uh, the water molecules. And so, super exciting. Isn't that super exciting? Yeah, see, there you go. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, yeah, so very exciting. Here's one last one. This one is in Texas. And again, this is going to be the... Um, uh, yeah, okay, you're right. So this is going to be the freshwater source here, and this is going to be towards the ocean or the ocean itself over here to the right. Again, the arrows indicate the velocity of water movement, and the colors represent salinity with hotter colors, fresher water, colder colors, more salt water. And this one goes pretty quick. Yeah. 
So you see in these last couple models, it's really this kind of wah, boom, wah, boom. So we hit, we hit peaks where we have really, really strong velocities and not necessarily for a huge uh, long period of time, but depending on, the, depending on the system, those velocities get quite strong. And so that has implications for if we're doing a restoration, let's say, and we're trying to revegetate an area that gets a lot of current, you got to know the maximum current so you can plan for your plants to, to be able to withstand that, for example. Okay, those are hydrological models. Okay, so let's, let's look now a little bit more about an example of some of these hydrological issues here in Southern California with some of our Southern California uh, tidal salt marshes. And I picked that just because it's a nice uh, complex thing or at least more than just a, a, a simple freshwater wetland somewhere in the Midwest. So this is seawater, so we're dealing with tides, firstly. Our freshwater source is coming from rainfall, but we're in a Mediterranean ecosystem, and indeed right now we're in a massive drought, which, might, which many indications seem to be suggesting this might be the new normal. Um, but in any event, Mediterranean climate, so the rains come... Uh, in the winter time, not much rains in the spring, summer when most plants and animals are actively growing, right? Uh, there's impoundment, meaning, meaning um, constrained movement of water, and then there's tons of human interventions. So to understand the hydrology for in this example here in Southern California, you would need at a minimum to understand these four things. Tides, freshwater inputs via primarily rainfall or, or um, subsurface movement, impoundments around the wetland, and then uh, any human uh, messing around with the water flows. So let's talk about our tides first. We have tides in our part of the world called, that are referred to as mixed diurnal. That means on any, any given time period, we have any given day, we have two highs and two lows. So we have a higher, we, on most days we have a higher high tide and a lower high tide and then a higher low tide and a lower low tide. That's, that's daily. Then over the course of a lunar month, which is 28 days, so sometimes that perfectly aligns with our calendar month, but usually it's a you know, couple days off. But, um, but by the lunar month, we have monthly high, highest high tides, we call those spring tides, even if, they're, if it's in the springtime or if it's in the wintertime, whatever, we call those spring tides. And then, low t and then a monthly low tide, which we call neap tide. And essentially we get spring tides when we get constructive or additive effects of the sun and moon. And you don't, you don't necessarily need to know about that, you just need to know that happens uh, so the, the uh, highest high tides happen when we have a, either a new moon or a full moon. So when the moon, you can't see the moon or the moon is super full, one or the other. And then we have the, the smallest tides when we have uh, so-called destructive. So when the sun and moon are acting against each other to lessen their gra the gravitational pull of one another. And that's going to happen when we have a quarter moon. Okay. If we talk, so that so that's that's the tide situation. We have mixed semi-diurnal tides. We have two highs, two lows per day. When it comes to freshwater inputs, this is a huge, 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 huge deal for us. Probably the most important high. Well, sorry, I should be careful when I say that, but it's it's one of the highest priorities to understand and to manage in doing wetland restoration here in Southern California and any area like Southern California, any area that's a semi-arid or arid um, place. Again, our rain, <laughs> whenever we get rain, right? In theory, we get rain. In theory, when we get rain, it's during the winter time and pretty much most summers we have nothing. And this really uh, puts us into much more of a press versus pulse type situation. So that's that's borrowing some concepts from uh, ecology, which is press is a, is a stressor, is, is a factor that's going to go on day in, day out. Pulse is going to be something that happens intermittently. So, yeah, I'll just say that. Yeah. So, so you have to figure out, are you, are you having this constant source of, say, 
groundwater that's coming in day in, day out, or are you only relying on surface water flows from natural channels? In which case, it's going to be much more like a pulse situation. The impoundments are legion here in Southern California, but indeed around across the globe in coastal areas. It's not unique to us. If you're interested in this, in this stuff, you should take uh, Dr. Patch's uh, new physical oceanography class. Um, she's, uh, you know, the world expert on uh, our littoral cells here in Southern California. But, um, but basically what we're talking about is impoundment is, is the not letting the water do whatever the water wants to do. These are common in Southern California. Part of it has to do with, a lot of it has to do with just the cycling of water off of our coast. So here, this is an old, this is an old picture of Magoo. This is back when we had a pier out there before the hurricane destroyed it. Yes, we have hurricanes here. Um, and so what you see is here's the freshwater source. Check it out. So I'm, I'm looking from the land into, uh, you know, excuse me, looking from the sea landward. So, so basically eastward is basically this direction. Westward is basically this direction. And here comes the freshwater source. When I first started looking at these historical photographs 20 years ago when I started working on salt marshes, I thought, oh my God, we've been messing with these wetlands for so long. Look, we screwed with the wetlands back then. Not true. This, I came to soon realize, is the natural state of things. So it wasn't the natural state for the, wa the fresh water to come down and then pew, go straight to the ocean. Because we have so-called um, longshore movement or longshore drift, our, the net movement of water and sand off our coast is this way, is down coast. So that's going to act to pull sand down this way. So when the, when the water is coming in, it's going to meet these, these currents offshore and act to, you know, still, of course, the water will go out to sea, but it's going to move down. So virtually all of our Southern California estuaries look like a capital letter L because the water comes in, goes way down to the right. So this you can consider is an impoundment. Many of our wetlands, this, this, this sand would then go and pinch off and close seasonally. So a, a complete impoundment or entrainment of water. So we have this littoral component that's going on all the time, day in, day out. And then we have this seasonal component that makes the wet, makes the salt marsh, for example, more likely to be totally cut off or less likely to be cut off from, say, the ocean, um, surface water connection with the ocean. You've already seen this, but here's the, the fourth example of consider, concerns for hydrology in our Southern California wetlands. And this is the altered, uh, this is just human alteration of stuff. Again, either intentional or unintentional, but in the case of Malibu, um, Malibu Creek, we saw that we actually increased the water, right? If you recall, in the 1950s, the historic condition was lots of, lots of rain, lots of movement in the freshwater source going into the salt marsh. And then during the dry times of the year, virtually nothing, the mouth would close and be completely impounded. And if you were a, if you were a little kid that put your boat in the salt marsh, it couldn't get out to the ocean for, for all those months. It's basically closed. You'd have to wait for the first big rains, which a big pulse of water would flow down the river and pop open the, the salt marsh, and then your boat could be connected to the ocean. So in this case, this uh, human intervention, in the case of the 1980s, as illustrated here by the pink line, um, is coming from our sewage treatment plant that we put in, which is putting in more water than historically it would experience. And so that, that was causing the mouth to say, um, in some cases, stay open longer than it should, and other issues. <laughs> 